Great, thank you, Andrew. Um, just checking, we, we'll run till about 12.25, five minutes after schedule. So I, I think we've got about 35 minutes for a conversation to open up. So uh, it's over to you. We've heard some fascinating examples. I wanted to know more detail about each one of them, so I'm sure questions will come up. But we've, we've spanned the continents and spanned the range of examples. So there's, there's lots to talk about, I'm sure. So it's over to you. Um, I'll just field the questions, really. Who'd like to start? Uh, Elena, I saw your hand first, and then come to Natalie. Um. Sorry. I suppose this is maybe mostly Don't a question. Don't forget to identify yourself. Oh, yeah, for sorry. The... Elena Bennett, McGill University. Um, mostly a question maybe for you, Steve, but I'm curious about everyone's response, which is just about the difference between working in a place like China, which has a very certain kind of management and decision-making structure that comes from the top, versus maybe working uh, in other places where decision-making is more complex and if any of you could sort of address what that looks like in terms of the various things that you were saying. Yeah, I'll start. Um, it's been fascinating working in China. And it, actually, the contrast in the last two years between working in China and working in the US on these issues is sort of night and day, right? I mean, it's it's. You do, uh, well, first of all, there is a close synergy between uh, the science academies and the government, and the government coming to the science academies and saying, you know, these are, the, these are our concerns, you know, we have tremendous problems with air and water pollution and, other, you know, environment is important, we need to start doing something, so tell us kind of rational approaches for how we're going to make progress on these things. So there's, it's much more, it, it seems, at least on the surface, uh, partnerships. And so, you know, at the kind of, that, that macro level, that, that you know, you, you, you see that. Um, at a more micro level, like getting back, getting down to what has to happen on the ground, you know, there are the, again, there's some dissimilarity, but there's more similarities. Um, because things actually on the ground, you know, there's a, there's a saying in China, the mountains are high and the emperor is far away. Like, what actually happens on the ground? You know, that's much more of this sort of give and take and negotiation and figuring out, um, you know, what, what, what will transpire. So, so there, are, there are some, uh, you know, definite similarities and, you know, getting things done. It is a much more top-down system. So, um, you know, the negotiations are weighted towards the central authorities um, in, in ways that make it, um, you know, on the plus side, things happen faster. On the downside, it's less democratic, and so things can get, you know, interests don't necessarily um, get represented. Um, so th there's another sort of set of trade-offs um, for you. But. Does anybody else want to come in? Carlos, um, sometimes it's helpful not to have a strong arm of the state when the state is going in the wrong way. <laughs> yeah, I, I mean... <laughs> Yes. However, however, I still I still prefer democracy. Uh, on the other hand, I mean democracy. But perhaps what we are seeing in many countries, this one, my own country, Brazil, is a failure of a representative democracy. And uh, uh, I would uh, basically say uh, this. The, the fact that in, in Brazil, I will talk about Brazil, for two decades, all polls asking people whether they want to protect nature, what, what, whether they, what, they are all against Amazon deforestation. 85% of the people in the Amazon are against Amazon deforestation, 90% in Brazil. A poll conducted a few days ago through, through between first round and runoff in the elections kept the same result. This is very reassuring. However, there is a, dis a disconnect between the will of the people, majority, 90%, and the, the way the, politic the politicians maneuver the system. In Brazil, the agribusiness has tremendous power. So they've been, for many decades, really giving the final decisions. So this is a permanent fight, and we should really hope and I think midterm elections here gave us a little bit more hope that uh, in Brazil, perhaps in four years, that uh, you know eventually democracy will, you know, the will of the people 
will prevail, but it's, it's very hard to predict that outcome. Uh, Sandra, Andrew, do you want to comment on this? Should we, any comments on this? No? Natalie, I think you were next in my queue, and then I've got a few other hands which I can see. <laughs> Yes, um, I'm sorry, I, I think Carlos might have actually answered it, because obviously Brazil is really sort of central um, in our awareness and concern at the moment. Um, and I just wondered that I'm really interested in and in, by the statistics on food security uh, that you presented uh, and, and how this is not an efficient model. And then you pro pro provide a sort of say that the economic case for, for the sustainable um, working um, working lands and sustainable working lands in, in Amazonia might work. But is, are those financial arguments going to be strong enough to deal with the cultural ties to cattle um, and political, obviously, as well. The two politics and culture are, are, are very intertwined on the cattle story and whether the, those financial arguments, whether you have hope that the financial arguments will transcend and, and you know, propel this transformation that you describe. Yeah, this is a good point because, you know, to understand the drivers of deforestation in the Amazon, uh, all over the Amazon, mostly in Brazil, you have to understand the cultural aspects of cattle, of uh, cattle ranchers. Uh, this is really the main driver, because the, you know the economy of cattle in the Amazon is very poor, less than one he he uh, head of cattle per hectare. The prevailing culture is really land tenure, historically. But unfortunately, over the last two decades, 25 years, the organized criminal rings in South America, they took over. So the beginning of the process is illegal logging. And then after illegal logging, that area which is being logged, it will become a cattle ranch, everything illegal. And then after a few years, that's the relate to the first question, uh, Brazilian, the, the, the House of Representatives Congress approves a new legislation which makes everything legal. Mm -hmm. It happened a couple of years ago. So this is a cycle. And uh, yes, uh, you know, one has to work also in education, really educating younger people really for the less need of, of land. And I, I have some hopes with this what is predictions for modern agriculture, agriculture of 21st century, to be more vertical, to be very, very highly efficient. So when that happens, perhaps the drive to own more land will diminish, I hope. Steve. Yeah, you know, sometimes you can make, you know, both the science argument and the economic argument that, you know, it's, it's better to do... Uh, more sustainable activity than an extractive industry, right? It, but, but then it doesn't happen. And so right now it's the question of what I was kind of putting into the politics and implementation. But, you know, y y who has the power in the system to make decisions or, you know, who, who actually does drive things and what are their incentives? And they're not necessarily aligned with long-term sustainability or the global good or even the good of the local people. So, you know, really, I think as a community, we need to pay much more attention to what the structure of the politics and those institutions actually are. Because we keep asking these questions like, you know, we'll do, we'll do a study saying, well, you know, it's clearly better, the social good is clearly better doing this, which is maybe more sustainable, and we don't get there. And, and, and largely, it's, it is explicable when you look at the dynamics within the system. A Andrew, did you want to come in? Yes, uh, thank you very much. Yeah, it's just um, speaking from experience on um, sort of localizing climate finance. I think in most situations, you need to work at multiple levels, but you also have to have a lever. Um, or it's very helpful to have a lever. Um, international finance can often provide that lever, but you need multiple levels and multiple partnerships. And if you can't work with international finance, then you have to find levers in the local political economy instead. Okay, I've got uh, Sandra Diaz, um, Chris, and Yadwin there in my queue, and I can see a few more hands as well. <laughs> so, Sandra, do you want to go first? I really enjoyed um, the way um, the sentence by Carlos um, that we needed a great acceleration in disruptive solutions. I think it encapsulated in a compelling way the spirit of many of the talks we have heard these two days. Um, so I, 
thinking of that and thinking that we are closing, uh, getting close to the wrap up of the meeting, I was asking myself what would be the role of different scientists in this um, great acceleration of disruptive change. Uh, most of us are um, full-time scholars. And according to our disciplines, what we should be doing if we want to be part of that change. Um, I, I really enjoy one of the subgroups yesterday. We had a lot of uh, great discussions, but most of the themes we focus on were social and political. So that's fine for social scientists, but then as a natural scientist, I wonder, what can I do? Shall I humbly join as a minor partner the social scientists? Because this is where the main questions are. Shall I just try to assist that and be a kind of a minor partner? That's one option. If maybe that's what we have to do in order to help this acceleration change. And if not, if there is still a lot of a role for purely natural sciences within a transdisciplinary scope, could we um, mention the main question we should be focusing on? Mm -hmm. Sandra, can I invite you to respond first? <laughs> start by responding to this. Um, I would say both. Uh, I think Natalie very rightly reminded us that a lot of the uh, good ecological science is actually not making it to a lot of the uh, uh, nature-based solutions and other initiatives that are on the ground. And we had multiple examples through yesterday as well. Um, and so um, my um, current thinking on this is, yes, you have to, be, to accept to be humble, to start as a, as a um, minor partner sometimes, but you've got to be ready to um, either provide or, uh, in fact, initiate um, the hard research that you need to answer some of the questions. Steve, you started out saying that the science was one of your four questions, so clearly there's a, there's a significant role still. Yeah, I mean, to me, it's, 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 the science is necessary but not sufficient, right? So, so yes, there's, there's a partnership. But I, the things, you know, I'm trying to think in, in my head w when things have been most successful, and it's when you have this close partnership. I mean, there are clearly scientific questions that you need answers to in order to say, you know, like your example. How are you going to, you know, you know, what are the options here? What are the things that you could do, the, the, the berry and, and then the economics and, and then the implementation? But if you don't have that option, you know, if you don't have that science base in the first place to know how does this action or this kind of management strategy matter for the things that we're trying to accomplish, then, you know, the economics and the politics on top doesn't matter. So it's it's the base of everything. It's but it's not. But it isn't everything, right? I mean, it has to work in partnership with these other things. Uh, just to add, I, I think you know, um, it, it's it's desirable and necessary that uh, uh, we we do advocacy for sustainability. Um, I might be exaggerating to say scientists play a fundamental role. In that, but uh, looking at climate change, you know, science played a very fundamental role in advocacy for sustainability. So I think for everything, and uh, I, I do believe scientists should really, as as you mentioned, to team up in interdisciplinary groups. And many of the, th the solutions certainly will come from science. Uh, I think Natalie has a comment on this particular point, and then we'll take the next set of questions. Yes, just briefly. I mean, I just think um, it's not just a question of, as, as natural scientists, doing more applied work and trying to address these problems. Uh, many of the ways we think about problem solving are incredibly important and valuable. The way you, Sandra, would think about you know, testing a hypothesis, you can apply that. That's transferable to tackling these questions. And there's a lot of scholarship and, and, and thinking that needs to be done about how we do this interdisciplinary work. And I think a lot of our training as natural scientists is, is, is really needed. So I, it's not just that we're an add-on or that we just need to do more applied science. We need to actually apply our ways of thinking to develop this, this field of interdisciplinary science to make it as robust as it needs to be. This Thank is you. great. This has opened up a nice dialogue. Nancy, it sounds like it looks like you want to comment specifically on this. So I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to keep I'm going to keep this conversation going before moving to the next question, if that's okay. Uh, so but Nancy, I do have you in the queue. <laughs> so Nancy Knowlton, Smithsonian. I, I think the 
the other thing that scientists could do much more effectively than they do, natural scientists, is actually to just talk about, explain, present, make available what we know and what we've learned about what works. I mean, the two talks this morning are both by people who have been you know, collecting, creating databases, and Elena didn't talk about it, but she has a website on Seeds of the Anthropocene. And, and I, what I have found over and over again is that we're producing all this science, but, but, but once we produce it, then we move on to the next science. We never take advantage of, I mean, that's sort of part of you know, the next grant proposal mentality. But at this point, with the 13 years or whatever it is that we've got left, and we've got to do a much better job of deploying the knowledge that we have. And that is something which a natural scientist is uniquely positioned to do. And so I think, like when I asked that question yesterday about successes, it was interesting because most of them were not, no one really talked about any actual past successes that we're going to do this or that. That's the that's typical scientist mindset. They, you know, once we've finished something, signed off on the grant report, we're on to the next problem. And if we could just do a better job of, of, of communicating what we've learned so that we have some chance of that knowledge becoming a part of a viral acceleration, which is what all of us have been talking about, not only, you know, in the talks, but also in the various discussion groups. I think you know, every single discussion group is sort of struggling with, you know, what, and as Chris put at the very beginning, you know, we need to step uh, our foot on the accelerator, but what actually does that mean? I mean, to me, that's the, the biggest challenge. So let's keep this going with three more comments. So I've got Nancy Grimm, Steve, and then Sandra. So let's take it to Nancy. Yeah, thank you. I, I actually think that, um, I just wanted to pick up on uh, Steve's point, and I think there's something for scientists in um, being sort of involved from the beginning or having these partnerships because it's not really just uh, that we're doing applied science. I don't think that's at all appropriate. It's not like we're being given, uh, we need to know the answer to this question, so please go out and get us the answer to this question. That's not it at all. It's much more of a, a case where, you know, and I found when working on the U.S. National Climate Assessment, I thought, oh, I've all these friends that work on climate change effects on ecosystems. This will be great. And then I found that we're just not answering the question. We're not asking the questions that are needed to do an assessment of what's really happening. And so it's really the way you ask the questions that I think is important. And so that's another thing that these partnerships will do. It will help you to say, and, and they're fantastic science questions. They are. I mean, it's not like we're doing anything that's sort of, you know, dumbing down our science or anything like that. They're really good science questions. And so to turn this into a question, <laughs> instead of just a comment, um, I wanted to ask Andrew, because uh, I was really fascinated by the work that uh, you're doing in, um, uh, in India and uh, related to Natalie's points about how there's a lot of money being spent, but very little of it has anything to do with ecosystems. So, so how much is, is science sort of playing a role in that? I mean, we've also heard that there's a lot of interest in reforestation, um, and that seems to be the main thing that we're doing. So how much is science playing a role in deciding what kind of work, for example, that these um, people are doing. Okay, um, and hold, hold on, we'll get Steve and Sandra to just respond to that science uh, yeah. question, and okay. then uh, I'll remind you about Nancy's question Thank you. after we finish that. So Steve, quickly. Great, thank, thank you. Um, the discussion is fascinating, and I've heard many times that science isn't enough, and we have to go from there, and, and it's just part of, the, part of the answer, and of course it is, and I've never known what that exactly means and, and where it all fits in, but, but Stephen said something that I thought, <laughs> helped me a lot, and I'm just going to ask if I got it right. You, I, you said that you design institutions so that winners have enough political power to carry out management actions. And that struck me as really important because science can help you with those management actions and to know who the winners are or what the, what the consequences are. And that struck me as a really great way of saying, well, this is the role of science, Nancy's action maps. Um, and it's also the limits of what science can do. So I was going to offer that, if, if that was right, as a, as a way of, of helping understand the way science helps and, and, the, and when it passes off the responsibility. 
Steve, respond to that, and then I'll pass on to Sandra. <laughs> Short answer, yes, you got it dead on. <laughs> okay, great. I thought, I thought that might be the response. <laughs> Sandra. Yeah, I wanted to emphasize one component. Uh, we heard in several talks, and I know that this actually um, is uh, something that a number of people in this room are doing, um, about uh, long-term research. Uh, long-term local research, and I believe to that um, some of the answers to some of the things that we were discussing here, I mean, that's obviously not the only answer, um, but long-term research at particular sites where the science gets embedded into the communities is one of the things that will get us as scientists to both uh, continue our um, top-notch science if we wish to, um, address solutions, and also produ co-produce these solutions with, uh, with people. Okay, I have a number of questions lining up, so we should move through this as rapidly as we can. Andrew, you've got a specific question to respond to, and then I'll, I'll move on to the others. Thank you very much. Yeah, um, I think uh, these kinds of models for local action that may be a bit outdated are informed by science. Of course, the problem is it's 20 or 30 year old science in many cases. So, I mean, the question is how do you? bring a sort of cutting edge understanding of a changing field down through bureaucracy you know, into the local space and make it real. Um, in relation to adaptation, I think that's much easier than it is in relation to mitigation because people can observe the effectiveness of adaptation action and you can bring that in, you know, whether monitoring services and other things. Um, but I think there is a really interesting question about you know, evolving approaches to uh, what good looks like in, at the, the landscape level. Um, including the, the carbon elements as well as the resilience elements. Um, so that, in a way, I was posing that as the research question, and it's a research question that involves both science, hard science and social science. So. Okay, I've had a few people waiting patiently, so Chris, you're, you're next in my, my queue. <laughs> Chris Field, I, I, I'm really curious about your thinking of the relative importance of efficiency versus robustness in the design of of these solutions, you, you know, I'm, each of you talked about a compelling solution, but I'm struck in, in California where I would argue we've had a relatively good success in tackling environmental problems. The hallmark of those successes has been for every problem there are a half dozen policies because one gets turned over in the court and one gets turned over in the next election. And, and um, when you think about implementing a set of, uh, well, a solution, how do you figure out how to, how to strike this balance between the efficiency, the thing, that the, the carbon price or whatever, and, and a set of solutions that's really going to be robust to the kinds of political changes and, and uh, economic changes and power changes that we've all been talking about? Who'd like to take that? <laughs> Steve. <laughs> I'll just try a partial. Chris, that's a great question. Um, I don't have a great answer um, because, it, I mean, it is essentially you're, you're trying to design, you know, if you're thinking about this kind of institutional design or where, where do you put effort into, you know, do you, do you try to get the carbon tax passed in Washington State or do you, you know, how do you, how do you or, you know, basically just say, hey, let's do more research on solar and wind because that's going to bring down the price and it's going to outcompete coal and uh, fossil fuels. Um, I think you asked the right questions. I think robustness actually, you know, robustness, resilience, that actually is sort of the right thing. I would argue actually that, you know, if you're really truly thinking about um, optimization or efficiency, but you're doing this in a stochastic dynamic framework, those two actually come closer um, together. But the point is you want to be thinking about a longer term where where surprises are going to happen, and so you want your policy advice or your push on what you're trying to do to actually be that kind of robust, resilient on the policy side, as well as you know what we think about for biodiversity and, and ecosystems. Um, I think I'm going to keep it moving. So, Yadvinda, you're next. Okay, excellent. Thank you for passing on. Uh, Tov, you're just back, um, and I. We haven't come to you yet, so you had a question way back. <laughs> Dove Sachs, Brown University. Um, I guess my question was more directed at Sandra and uh, Stephen, but this issue has come up a bit in the last couple of days of ecosystem. Like Sandra gave the example that there could be new ecosystem services that blink into importance with climate change. 
And, and the opposite's also true, right? Like, uh, a lot of the current footprint of salt marshes around the world is going to be drowned and they'll be gone, right, by the end of the century with sea level rise. So whatever services they provide, where they currently are, will be gone. And the, the question I have is, in the context of climate change in this very dynamic world, it, it's a question for ecosystem services. It's also a question for conservation. Like, wh what, what do we do when we think that there's whole sets of services or places that will stop being important um, or will start being important? And how do we plan in that kind of context? That's the question. <laughs> So um, the first thing is um, obviously to get the knowledge of what's going to be happening, and this is where a lot of the scenario work has um, a lot to provide. And the other one um, I would like to insist on is preparedness. So you have to make people aware of what's going to be happening. There's some work going on, for instance, in uh, Pacific um, Island states where people will know full well what's going to happen to their islands. And the idea is to work with them through, for example, pathway approaches um, about when they're going to lose each ecosystem, which ecosystem services, when is it actually uh, the time to think about moving to another island, um, and examples like this. Steve, do you have? Yeah, uh, you know, as, as, as um, coming back, actually, to, to Chris's point just a moment ago about you know thinking about robustness resilience, I mean, and and earlier you know Sandra you opened up this thing about the role of science. I mean, so, in a way, science has to be there to tell you about like what's going to happen in the way off future, right? I mean that those are tough questions to know. Like how is this not just you know what's the change in global temperature, but how does that manifest itself in a particular place? How's that going to change the functions in a way that? people care about or depend upon. So that, that's really important. But then, you know, on the policy side, um, so suppose I have a clear science answer. Like you said, we're going to be drowning out the marshes. Let's say Louisiana, the marshes are going to be gone. And there are people down there who live in communities that are basically going to be underwater. And, you know, we have a difficult policy choice. The kind of I don't know, in a way, the efficient answer of this is to tell people, you have to move. But that's a really difficult thing to do on the policy front. So, you know, there's going to be uh, some difficult questions, you know, and this is where the science policy, you know, either gets challenging or interesting. Um, you know, here are the costs and the benefits, but these come to particular people, and there may be, you know, real attachment of these people to this place that has to be factored in. Uh, to these things, but it's we oftentimes it's much easier just to look at the present and not think. But with climate change, we we have you know we have an obligation, I think, as science, to think clearly about what these future consequences are, because many of the investment decisions that we make now are lasting decades. Um, and then you know, picking up on Nancy's point, clearly communicating this. You know, here are the trade-offs, or here are the consequences. <laughs> Okay, we've got Camille and Daniela in the queue, and then one last question. Probably we'll get through those three, and I think that might be it. <laughs> Hi, uh, it's kind of getting back to what should <coughs> scientists be trying to do. In, in thinking of the USA and Brazil in particular, where the central governments, which is what these kind of forums typically tend to, to our products tend to go to the central governments, and in both those countries, the central governments have become less environmentally progressive, uh, less work on climate action. And yet in both of those countries, there's a lot of local interest for environmental action and climate action. So I'm wondering if, if you have some ideas about how we can kind of shift our, the translation of our science from going to these big kind of national assessments, which the central governments aren't doing anything with, um, versus trying to directly get to the sort of city level or county level. And I mean, one idea I had is if in the USA, the mayors have an annual convention every year. Would it be worth actually and having, and the governors, and would it be worth having panels, you know, actually setting up a scientific panel at these every year, even, that would discuss the science of climate change action, behind climate change action and whatnot? Or any other ideas? <laughs> Carlos, it sounds like that's something you might be well-placed to comment on. Well, <laughs> I, I, 
I follow your your ideas completely. In fact, I mean, perhaps I'm being optimistic, but I think, uh, you know, CO2 emissions in the U.S. declined in 2017, and I hope it will decline in 2018. Um, if that happens, probably it shows that these subnational arrangements are working. And uh, I'm really, in Brazil, I'm starting to think seriously about that, to start organizing subnational national arrangements, mostly for against deforestation, things like that, but also energy. Because I think, you know, if that's working in the U.S., even against some di directives from national governments, but uh, in Brazil it could also work, because states and cities, mostly cities, may be willing to follow that path. So I'm very hopeful that we will be able really to make uh, democracy in that sense work better. And there's a, uh, Daniela, let, let's just move on to your next question. <laughs> it, it follows up very nicely from that. We've heard a lot of information over the last two days. And there are several people in this room who will have the privilege of summarizing that information for the next IPCC report. For those of you who looked at the structure, there's a very strong focus on solutions, on giving examples, on telling stories. How are we making sure that the information we've heard about is made available in a way that it's useful, understandable, and, and synthesizes some of those examples so that they can be implemented in this report. Because there's so many things to choose from, and it's not always easy to pick out which ones, you know, also to show those which didn't work so that people can learn from it. So, uh, it sounds like that might be something for Janet and Yadvinda to pick up on as well. Uh, as we think about dissemination um, yeah, and next steps, but um, is there anybody who'd like to comment on that from the panel, or should we just take our last question? Um, yeah, fine. Uh, Pete Mumby, University of Queensland. I'd just like to follow up on Nancy's point about how we can have mostly academic scientists do a better job of embedding their science in the processes in government and local communities. And one of the things I've seen that's really positive is the switch of government and university reward systems. So there's greater emphasis on demonstrating the impact of your science, not just its academic impact. But one of the challenges with that is that it's incredibly time consuming to do a good job of it. You know, so I spend, for example, we all do this, but weeks and weeks every year working with government in a variety of countries, trying to get long-term relationships embedded that work and the science into the processes. Now, my dean will say to me, you're spending a lot of time doing that. Is it worthwhile? And I say, in terms of number of publications, no. But in terms of impact, sure. I can afford to do that because I don't need the papers as much. But my real concern and question is, with younger faculty coming through, they're entering this system where they also need to develop those long-term relationships and demonstrate impact. But they're in a more vulnerable, vulnerable position because they also need to fulfill all of the other criteria for promotion. So my question is, what can we do uh, either as societies or as institutions to facilitate new, younger scientists coming through the system so that they can uh, legitimately spend all of that time creating greater impact without that being a, a sort of disadvantage to them through the promotion process and so on. There's a, there's a very anxious hand at the back, so I'm going to let that comment in and then maybe just wrap up. This is Sarah Javi from the University of Minnesota. I just would mention that I've been involved in an effort at our institution uh, through the Office of Community Engaged Scholarship that is part of a national network in the U.S. of community engaged scholarship that's actually working to develop explicit criteria for promotion that include things that we never consider. Um, so as a, like a, I mean, so this is like just a nascent <laughs> effort, but as a first step, we're starting to do an evaluation of the tenure documents, um, guidelines at our institution, just to see how well they fit the, these criteria. And the first one that I looked at, which was a, from a very applied department, <laughs> fit these criteria extremely poorly. Um, <laughs> but I think that's an example of what you're asking for. Um, that we actually, you know, take what we value and turn that into the criteria that we're using for promotion. 
uh, as those of us who inhabit the British academic spectrum know, the, the incentives have been kind of slightly reformulated to require departments to submit impact case studies. Uh, I have to say that's not an incentive because if you have to try and write one of those impact case studies as I'm currently doing, it's, it's painstaking and it's really difficult. It takes all the joy out of the work that you're actually doing. <laughs> so <laughs> um, I think we should really close because it is 12.25 and I don't want to delay lunch. So thank you for a fantastic discussion. Thank you to the panelists. Great job. <laughs> Janet, over to you. All right, thank you very much to this panel. I'd like to uh, adjourn for lunch. I'd love to get back on schedule, so if we could reconvene here at 1.20, as it says in the program, uh, so that we could get some um, suggestions that I hope Yadvinder will give us when we break into our next workshop. We can then go to those workshops. It'll be your same group, I think in the same rooms. Uh, no, okay. <laughs> we'll, we'll, yes, yeah, so reconvene here for your uh, marching orders. Uh, and if the facilitators could meet uh, here, uh, give up part of their lunch, and meet up here at about 1 with the staff um, for, uh, for a briefing about those, uh, wor the workshop. All right, thanks, everyone. <laughs>